Well, good morning to Boxborough Church. Uh, glad you're with us on this uh, summer Sunday. And for those of you who are online, uh, welcome to worship. One of the things about an interim um, are new hymns. And so many of them. How could, how could this be that there are so many new things to, to try? So um, we have three today, maybe only two, that might not be familiar to you. And one that we would like to practice, I'd like to um, say a few words about this hymn because it was groundbreaking. Um, God has been still speaking for thousands of years, and we can see it in our own hymnal with uh, Come We Who Love God's Name, which we're going to sing together that first verse just to get um, accustomed to it. If you look in your hymnal um, at page 379, you'll see a different iteration of this hymn by Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts was a, a hymn writer uh, back in the 1700s. He was appalled by the quality of congregational hymn singing, so he picked up his pen and decided to rectify that by, um, set, by creating new hymns uh, for people to sing and that might be more singable. So you'll see an Isaac Watts uh, hymn here that actually was um, uh, common in New England. And in the middle of a church fight, a second verse was added. So verse two was, uh, came out of a church conflict. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God uh, was during a conflict with the choir who were, they were beginning to refuse to sing hymns. And so this uh, verse was inserted to try to uh, cajole them into joining in with the, the hymn singing. Now on 382, which is just one page away, you're go going to see a version of this that was um, adapted by Robert Lowry. He was a Baptist in New York City after the Civil War, and he was the one who introduced the innovation of refrains, that he wanted to build up congregational singing by having a refrain, even if they uh, stumbled over the text, um, they could join in and enjoy the refrain. So, and it, it dropped out of use. I think in New England, it's very common in the South uh, and especially popular in African-American churches there. Um, and it's really fun to sing once you get the hang of it. Uh, but since we're not used to it, I've asked Todd to come forward. And it, the idea is not for him to sing a solo. The idea is uh, for you to sing with him um, and we'll sing just the first verse. And Jill will join me and too. And I will join you, yes. <laughs> 382 in your hymnal. Come we who love God's name and let our choice be known. Together God great love proclaim, together God's great love proclaim, and thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching forward to was just wonderful. Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right. Um, I'd like to uh, invite you to find the friendship registers that are at the end of your row. Um, please sign those and pass them up and down your row. Uh, have a look at them and please uh, greet one another following the service of worship. At the back of your bulletin, you will find uh, announcements. Um, probably the biggest one is that Jen is on vacation this week. So we're, we're all getting ready. Um, Rick and I will uh, keep limited office hours here this week. Uh, but we certainly will be very glad when she returns on July 15th. Are there other uh, concerns or announcements for the church this morning? If not, let us continue our service of worship with the introit. Let us break bread 
Thank you. Please stand if you are able and let's join together in the call to worship. Come, together God's great love proclaim, let us pray. O oh God, our thanks and praise we bring for love so deep and broad. We also come in your name to meet new family, to practice hospitality, to proclaim the need to change, to cast out demons, and to heal and be healed. Be with us here and send us forth in your spirit. Amen. So let's sing together, Come We Who Love God's Name, verses 1, 3, and 5. be seated. Bring to God your fear of who you are and have confidence that God can use even our weaknesses to redeem and empower. Let us pray together. O oh God, you offer us strength, yet we seek our security elsewhere. You have called us as we are, and yet we believe in our weaknesses more than in your power. Heal us and use our weaknesses to heal. God understands our weaknesses and is acquainted with our needs. God's grace is sufficient, for power is made perfect in weakness. Accept the reign of love among us. Be the church. Reach out to the broken and troubled world we live in. Amen. And since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of God be with you.
be shy. You can go right back to the, to pray, to the prey ground uh, following, but uh, come join us here in the front. Otherwise, you can't really see the pictures. Here we go. Well, the book I have today is one called Not the Piano, Mrs. Medley. Mrs. Medley has just moved near the seacoast, and her grandson, Max, has come to visit. And so she says, oh, let's go find the beach. So she gets out some towels. But before she could even get out the door, she's there going, you know, maybe we should take some rain gear in case it rains. So suddenly she has raincoats, boots, an umbrella, and they start down the street again. And she stops and says, oh, but maybe we'll need toys. So she comes back and gets a card table, a Monopoly game, and other toys. And then barely does she get down the street when she says, oh, maybe, maybe we need music. So she goes back and gets a boom box and tapes, bongo drums. And she's going down. And Max is going, let's just go to the beach. And they get to the beach. And Mrs. Medley goes, oh, look how big it is. And she starts to wander in. He says, oh, let's start digging for clams. And then she gets into the water, and Max is there going, well, what about the boots, the raincoat? She says, oh, you don't need that. And then Max says, you know what we didn't bring? Bathing suits. <laughs> so now they have to go back and get bathing suits. And at the end, Max is going, I know, Grandma, but, you know, what if you need a globe, badminton set, ice cream maker, garbage disposal, and a piano? And she says, oh, a piano? Max, you're so silly. <laughs> this is a silly story, but it reminds me of the story that we're going to hear uh, this morning when uh, uh, Reverend Jill reads the Bible lesson. It's about Jesus giving instructions to the disciples about that they can travel light. He tells them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money, to wear sandals, and not to put on two tunics or shirts. You know, to do the work that Jesus asked us to do, to forgive, to share, to care, to pray, to help, to bless, to love neighbors and God, doesn't require a lot of stuff. So we do not need to delay doing what Jesus asked by gathering stuff or taking pianos to the beach. We just need to forgive, share, care, pray, help, bless, hope, love neighbors and God. Let us pray. Set us on your path this day, O God, that we may be like Jesus, traveling light, so that nothing gets in the way of the task you've given to us, to forgive, to share, to care, to pray, to help, to bless the hope, and to love our neighbors and our God. Amen. Well, thank you, and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. You may go back to the playground. As Rick said, um, we, we have instructions um, for the mission here in the text I'm going to read from Mark. Um, it's, it's actually shocking when we think about it, take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics, which um, when I think about how Rick and I travel, we always manage to fill up our, our car. It doesn't matter where we're going, whether it's for one night or five. Um, we don't bring a piano, but we get close. And here are people who are instructed to go out in extreme vulnerability. They're not to carry money or food with them. 
they're to completely rely on the hospitality of those who are to receive them. I was so impressed by this text that I interviewed Mormon neighbors about it because the Latter-day Saints took this chapter and verse as their model for permission. Uh, and I said, you're still doing it now, why? And, and what does it do for the church to send people out in this kind of vulnerability? And he said, in the West, they were brutally oppressed. Uh, people chased down Mormons. They finally had to end up at Salt Lake as a place that was safe for them to create a community and grow. But there always would be someone who would receive them and who were so impressed by this show of vulnerability that it helped to convert much of Utah and beyond. Um, they said, actually, the value wasn't in the number of converts. The value of it was what it did for the missionaries themselves, that they were transformed. And to this day, when they do the missions, it does more for the building up of their community. And the, the ones who go out two by two are changed um, by that experience of offering themselves in such a vulnerable way. So here now, the lesson from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that had been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the vi villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home, a long way from home. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. A long way from home. A long way from home to be 
Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling to you and to me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Come Thank you. So friends, let us pray. Come Holy Spirit to open our hearts to receive your word and then free us to follow in the power of Jesus' love. Amen. Our gospel this morning is the story of Jesus coming home to teach and preach. He, a product of their upbringing, has the temerity to imply that he has what, good news for them. You know, families are often surprised at the shortcomings their children can identify. In bringing his teaching home, it's clear to them that the upbringing that he received at home has been received as inadequate, and he's been listening to other parents. Is this not the carpenter's son? You know, now instead of asking him to come home, you can see that they want him to leave home. You know, which is harder? Protesting in the street or at the family table? Family table. Yeah. A friend tells the story that his difficulty in changing his mind and heart about race 50, 60 years ago was not that it went against everything he had been taught, but that it went against everything he had been taught by people he loved. To counter their teaching was to betray and to reject them. In 1949, Teaneck, New Jersey, was awarded the status of model town and was used as a municipal model 
for people in occupied Japan. Black families, Jewish families, you know, moved into Teaneck with existing white families. And in 1955, the diversity of Teaneck was featured on NBC as a model of racial unity. And in 1965, it was the first town in the nation where a white majority voted for school integration. Throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, people who moved into Teaneck were buying into this harmonious vision. Discord, however, set in following the 1990 shooting of Philip Parnell, an African-American teenager by Gary Spaeth, a white Teaneck police officer. Mike Kelly's book, Color Lines, The Troubled Dreams of Racial Harmony in an American Town, tells the story, and now 30 years later, the same tragedy and painful awakening that all is not as harmonious as people thought has been repeated again and again and again. Eric Gardner, Staten Island, Tamir Rice, Cleveland, Michael Brown, Ferguson, George Floyd, Minneapolis, Breonna Taylor, Louisville, are but a few. You know, not unlike family members sitting around the kitchen table and avoiding certain topics, or delegates avoiding one difficult conversation because of another difficult history or the tension that accompanies the conspiracy of silence that has maintained the community's long-held vision of itself as harmonious is difficult to be, it is difficult to be heard or speak in a situation where you want to maintain a relationship and ask for change. You know, isn't that what Jesus is doing when he goes home or when he comes to us? You know, I love you just as you are, but because I love you, please change. You know, change how you relate to your brother. Change how you relate to alcohol or food. Change the priority you place on your work. Change your willingness to overlook that how others must live. Today's story continues with Jesus commissioning the initial 12 disciples. Now, in 2024, in a modern world, we're a little uneasy when we hear Jesus send out the disciples with authority over unclean spirits and that the disciples went forth casting out demons. You know, we roll our eyes and say, oh, there's no such thing as unclean spirits, invisible powers. But think with me for just a moment. We know that abusive parents are often abused children themselves. You know the old adage, hurt people hurt people. We would not say that they are possessed, but nevertheless, they are caught in a cycle of violence motivated by an invisible power, an unclean spirit that is larger than they. While we would say that those without a future, caught in a cycle of poverty, a culture of homelessness, you know, are possessed, nevertheless, there are communities of people, innocent individuals, caught in a cycle of violence, motivated by an invisible power and an unclean spirit larger than they are. There was an assessment tool published recently in the, in the paper an assessment tool for children living through a difficult, contested, conflicted, and angry divorce. And it asks, when your non-custodial parent who has promised to pick you up and take you to a special event does not show, do you A, 
go back to your room and cry. B, go hit your younger brother. Or C, you, you get the picture here. Now, we would not say the child is possessed any more than we would say that about you. After a bitter day at work, you storm home, yell at your spouse, kick the dog. Motivation, however misplaced the anger, is an invisible power. Jesus sent the 12, sends us, out into the world with authority over unclean spirits, which says to me that the mission has very little to do with Damien or whatever Friday the 13th evil spirit is lurking at the local cinema, and a whole lot more to do with reconciliation. You know, the one truth of our ghost story tradition is that people and houses are haunted when something's been left unresolved, you know, unreconciled. For this world to be healed, to be a better place, to be the place that God intended, it is going to take a whole lot more than our being better people. There are a lot of unclean spirits out there that most of the time we simply live with. We don't even notice them. There are invisible powers that haunt each of our families, not allowing one or another to speak or to be heard. There are invisible powers drawing energy, life, from justified and unresolved suspicions that haunt black-white relations. It's not just economic times that determine the budgetary priorities of our community, our state, our nation, but also the haunting of pride and prejudice, fear and greed. The ministry to which you and I have been called, the journey on which we have been set, is one of reconciliation, of casting out unclean spirits, even those whom we love just as they are and are nevertheless in need of change. Ouch. You know, that's not a place we want to be. Because change only comes with the risk of rejection. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. You know, our language has biased the word repent with the nuance of wrongdoing. So I invite you to go back to the original Greek and hear it as change, or to change direction. To change direction, an abuser will have to face the cross, their, victor, their victim and themselves, such that a person's life and self-identity must die to be born again, resurrected, a new person. To change the direction of those caught in the undercurrent of hopelessness, in the undertow of underemployment, to change the direction of those ill-equipped for the future will require that some of our national myths and prejudices must die for a new America to be born, to be resurrected. To change the direction for one whom love has disappointed or passed by will require that the one who's been shortchanged to forgive the other, to let an idealized relationship die so that a true one may be born. To correct injustices means change and risking rejection. And when you take such a risk, it is reassuring to know that you have been given authority over unclean spirits and not they over you. The Jesus you follow died on a cross to reconcile the world unto itself and to God. Discipleship leads to rejection, even to a cross, but not to despair. Discipleship is a journey through despair and death as they are not the destination. New life, transformation, 
Easter is the ultimate stop. So look around you. You're not alone in discipleship. You know, you have companions here. You know, 10 are in service in, you know, in, Maine, in the Maine Seacoast Mission this morning. In fact, you have millions of companions in this generation and in the generations that preceded us and that will follow us, participating in change, in repentance, in building a future which is known only by hope, in discovering in those companions a family, and finding in the realm of God a home that takes you as you are and as the you into which you will be changed. May it be so, and thanks be to God. Amen. We have another hymn that is relatively new. It's, uh, it's one that is built on top of a, an old Scottish uh, folk tune. In fact, uh, it says it's, it's called uh, Kelvin Grove. Kelvin is the river that runs through the middle of, of Glasgow, and there is a park called Kelvin Grove uh, down near the University of Glasgow, uh, if you've been over there. Uh, but it's, a, it's an easy tune. I think you'll find it easy to sing, so uh, please rise as you're able, and we'll be singing verses uh, you know, 1, 3, and 5. It's printed on page 7. be seated. As we gather for prayer, I'll start with those prayer requests that were written in the book, and this is something we're trying to introduce, so I hope you'll see it every Sunday, uh, but as you come in, there's a book for you to write in prayer requests. Uh, I'll, I'll offer you a moment, uh, in, in, in just a moment, to, uh, uh, to vocalize others that may not have gotten written in. But, but our hope is that over time, people will write these in as they come in on, on Sunday morning. Uh, prayers for the, um, the Boxborough people that are on the mission trip in Maine. Uh, Art, Connie, Jim, Lee, Dave, Kelly, Peter, Mary Ellen, Chris, and Greg. Uh, prayers for wisdom and discernment for the search process. Prayers for the former employees of uh, UKG uh, that were laid off this week. Uh, all total globally, it'll be uh, 2,200 people. And for Victoria and her medical uh, staff at Donna uh, Farber. Are there other concerns this morning? Andy?
Other concerns this morning? Yes. For, uh, this is for uh, a family of Dave who passed away two weeks ago. Other? Well, keeping in, in our hearts now the uh, concerns of those going to, to, to bury ashes uh, this, this coming weekend, uh, Dave's family and, uh, and our own um, people on the main seacoast, uh, those who uh, also those who are participating in our own search process here at uh, at Foxborough and for those uh, former employees at, at UKG uh, let us now bring those and those in our hearts to prayer well Lord of us all be with us in our search for all that is holy and true in this life. Spare us from false allegiances and draw us to you. And gracious God, be with us as we seek to follow Christ. Help us to cry out at injustice, to bind the wounds of the sick, to name evil as evil and not good. Stand with us when commitment and loyalty to you brings us to the cross. Empower us with the hope of resurrection a hope larger than the threat of death, that we may fulfill the destiny you have chosen for us and your love of us and all creation. All this we ask in the name of the one who came that we, that we might both find and follow and who taught us how to pray, saying, Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, Jesus calls us to travel light as we serve the world, for God is our strength and provision. So let us faithfully bring our offerings to God. And let us pray together. Uh, thank you, God, for your steadfast love. We offer our praise. May it reach to the ends of the earth. 
We ask that our gifts empower ministry in this place and wherever influences can reach. Amen. Well, friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and the west and gather, and gather about Christ's table. This table is for all who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. Everyone is welcome at Christ. You may be seated. And let us pray. Holy God, we praise and bless you for creation, for the gift of life, for your abiding love which brings us close to you, the source of all blessing. We thank you for revealing your will for us in the giving of the law and the preaching of the prophets. We thank you especially that in the fullness of time you sent Jesus, born of Mary, to live in our midst, to share in our suffering, and to accept the pain of death at the hands of those whom he loved. We rejoice that in the victory over the grave, you raised Christ with power to reign. We celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to gather your church by which your work may be done in the world and through which we share the gift of life eternal. Now we remember on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread. He blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. In like manner, after the, after the bread, Jesus took the cup and poured it saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Gracious God, we ask you to bless this bread and cup and all of us with an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, the church, your servant people, that we may be salt, light, and leaven for the furtherance of your will in all the world. Amen. Come for all things are ready. This morning we will receive communion by intention. Uh, you're invited to come forward in, in one line. Um, uh, Larry and I will, will be uh, up here, uh, one holding the bread, the other the cup. Uh, please take uh, the bread and dip it into the cup and then return uh, to your seat by the outside aisle. Uh, the bread is gluten-free and the cup is alcohol-free. If you need to be served where you, uh, where you sit, uh, please raise your hand or, or catch the eye of a deacon or a minister and we will come to you. So come, let us keep the feast. What's that? Is there a joke first? Oh, we'll come, we'll come back. Let's...
And let us pray together. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as you're able, please rise and let us join in our closing hymn, Guide My Feet. While I run it, Friends, go out into this day free, freed from fear to build trust, freed from despair to build up love, freed from disorder to build up community. And may the power of God, the heart of Jesus, the embrace of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and all your days. Amen. May be seated. Yeah. <laughs> Very sorry to God.